leave it up to Jim now, and you guys can talk uh, title tactics. Title bass tactics. There you go. So again, welcome to our uh, fishingme.org fishing classes, and I appreciate Paul uh, allowing me to come here. Again, I'm Jim Sutton. On behalf of Richmond Marine Center and Mercury Marine, uh, two of my sponsors, uh, we thank you for uh, your dedication and service to our country. Um, many of you know that I spent 20 years uh, in the uh, Navy as well. I retired in 99, and uh, um, I know that you folks go through a lot more than what I went through in my 20 year career, and I just want to say I thank you, and my family thank you, and, and um, I enjoy doing this. But today we're going to talk about how uh, to bath tactic. It's going to be a really what I call a facilitated type class. I want everybody to get involved. Eventually, I'm going to sit down and have Paul maybe. You know, move the uh, slide or the uh, uh, verbiage around, but we're going to take and go through. I took and brought together uh, several different topics that I pulled from again BassResource.com. I, you know, I'm not up here promoting them or any one particular website, but if you if you want to learn a lot about bass fishing, there's a lot of ways that you can take. Of course, look it up on the internet. If you and you young people uh, can probably you know look up internet better than what I can or, or do searches. Um, I know my daughter can, she just flies through them, and it takes me a little while to type, you know, two fingers and a thumb pecking and hunting and, okay. Anyway, uh, so I use BassResource.com, uh, I get regular mailings from them, you can log into them, get your own account, it doesn't cost you anything, they send you updates anytime uh, the professionals uh, do a article and stuff, so I pull together uh, this information, uh, some from the fishermen, some from BassResource.com. The reason why I did is because uh, I, I know Pete Cusset, he's uh, talked about in here some. I know Steve Conconis, which is also a guy has been for many, many years on the Potomac River. I know him personally. So his information is in here. So we're going to go through this and just talk about how bass tactics. Now up to this point, we've had a lot of fishing classes and we've talked about you know, the pinch and the flipping. We've talked about different rods and reels. We've talked about uh, junk fishing when tank was in here. So we've talked about a lot of different things. Well, now it's time to understand some of the strategies, all right, on fishing tidal bass or, or tidal bass tactics because you are typically around what? One of the greatest fisheries on the East Coast, if not the United States, and that's the Potomac River. But what's also hot about the state of Virginia, you have also the James River. You have the Chick River, you got the Pun Pun the Mine River. I mean, you got so many tidal water fisheries. Well, tidal water, and that's exactly what it means, tidal water. So it's in relationship to the moon phase, etc., and the Earth's gravity because tidal water is in conjunction with the ocean current. All right? So it's a lot different than a reservoir, okay, a big reservoir like Kern Reservoir that I fished last month, or it's a lot different than Lake Anna, which is only about a 10,000 acre lake. So there's a lot of different things you have to understand, and there is a difference in how you fish tidal water compared to how you fish a reservoir. You use some of the same tactics or presentations, all right, but you have to think differently. One of the big things with tidal water is the coastal water that you're pushing and pulling water, okay, every six hours on the average. Plus or minus a few minutes, but every six hours, tide's coming in and tide is going out. In other words, the water rises and the water lowers, okay? Now, depending upon how far that is away from, say, the ocean foot, like in this case with the Potomac or the James River or those type of lower tributary waters, it's the Chesapeake Bay. So the closer you are to the Chesapeake Bay, the maybe the faster the pool and the higher and the lower that water will rise. The Potomac will rise on an average a foot and a half, okay, on average, unless you get an ebb tide, or, or something like that, and we're not going to get into the explanation of what a net tide is versus this type of tide. We're going to keep it simple. But, or if all of a sudden, you know, the moon phase shifts, you also have a higher tide. All right, we'll talk about what you do on higher tide or in higher water. But for example, like I say, the Potomac is one and a half foot tide. I just fished the James River or the Chick River, uh, Chickahominy River uh, last weekend. That tide could fluctuate three and a half feet. All right, and that's only a three-hour drive south, but I'm closer to the Chesapeake. All right, the James River drops three and a half to four feet. 
the Elite Series is going to be up here in Connecticut next month, and they're going to deal with a six-foot tie drop when they fish that uh, professional tournament on the Elite Series. I forgot what actually the name of Connecticut. But hey, if you pick up a ride, maybe talk to USO going up there on the final way in, that would be a feat to see. You see all the pros and watch their way in and everything because the pros that don't make the cut on the last day, the last 20, I think the last 25 or 12, the last 12, um, then um, they stay around on that day and, and there's all kinds of things they do and, and talk about and, and do with the uh, spectators. So right then and there, I've just explained and described all kinds of things. Now, anglers acquainted with tidal waters appreciate the dynamics. I do. I love fishing tidal water. Am I, am I the best at it? No. But I might be better than John Doe if I'm competing to determine he's not a fisherman. We had the Bath Northern Opens on the James River the last few years. This year they switched over to Douglas Lake. All the guys from up north that complain about the tidal water. They can't catch any fish because they don't understand how to fish tidal water. It's different. But I like it because it's dynamic. Why is it dynamic? First of all, I have constant moving water. A reservoir, okay, like her reservoir, is only going to move when that dam pulls water. And you don't know when the dam is going to pull water. I have a phone number when I was on Curve Reservoir, all right, but guess what? They pulled Thursday and Friday. I caught fish. I mean, I probably had an 18 pound bag on Friday. Guess what? Saturday, they did not pull water. The fish was not biting. Everybody, you know, you had to, I think the tournament winning weight was 14 pounds. I had nine pounds. But I made a wrong decision. But if I made the right decision that I made in that afternoon, if I flip flop what I done, I might have been at the top. But that's why I call it fishing instead of catching. You know, you make decisions, you live with those decisions, you commit yourself, and you work. I mean, but that's the part of it. But the tidal water is dynamic. That water is constantly moving. Okay, it's rising, it's lower. I fish the Potomac tide different than I fish the James River tide. Why? Because the James River tide in a 15 mile or a 20, yeah, about a 20 mile, uh, maybe 15 to 20 mile stretch, I can't be exact. I could be fishing the last two hours of incoming tide, or I mean outgoing tide, which I like the outgoing tide better. And up in Osborne, 20 miles away, the tide would just be getting high. Well, you say, Jim, how could that be true? It is how the tide constantly fluctuates with the ocean current. All right, and the moon phase, it's, it's, it's awesome. So I can take and what we call fish to tide. I'm down at the lower end of the river, fishing the last three hours of, of outgoing tide, which in my opinion is some of the best time. And on the James River or the Potomac, I want to fish the lowest possible tide that I can, okay, around structure, whether it be grass, lily pads, rocks, stumps, you know, logs, it doesn't make a difference, structure. Why? When the water rises, bass rise. When that water rises high and gets back into that arrowhead pad and, and the grass, grass line and stuff like this, they get back in there where boats can't get. I don't care how good you are, then you ain't getting them. If it's a normally high tide or net tide or a flood stage tide, you're definitely going to get to them. And when the tide drops, it's not even drop at its normal stage. So that's when fish scatter at the high part. We'll go through all these different series. So that's why I like the last lower part of the tide. So on the Jager, I run the tide more so than I run the tide here on the Potomac. Meaning that I can take and the Potomac plus for an hour and a half, I can go into a 200 yard stretch and know that I can fish it all day and have the tide come to me. Okay, and what I mean by that is I know about what stages that the fish should be biting when the fish should be at. I can fish a hundred yard stretch all day. Because I know where the fish should be and where the fish should be at. Alright, the James River, I do that, but I have to run the tide more. So those are some of the aspects about tidal uh, bass, bass tactics and, and everything. So when there's questions and all, please stop and ask you. So I got my pointer here. Um, let's see. So the moon is gravitational tugging of oceans of mass, okay, and we see with regularity the tide comes up now. We talked about that. Tidal moon allows you to plan and strategize better. In my opinion, 
All right, and Pete Cuss Cussett as well. Whoa. There you go. The, I can plan my day of fishing better because I can go to any saltwater tide or I can type in Virginia tide and it comes up and I can put in any day, any time frame, and I can find out what that tide is doing. Today, our, our um, GPSs and our depth finders and your, your ranch units and other units, they actually have tides built into them. Because the tides, based upon the, gra the uh, gravitational pull of the earth, are pretty much the same from one year to the next, but then they drop and, and cycle out 45 minutes difference every time. So you can pretty much know what, what goes on. So any questions up to this point? Am I talking too Greek? Am I keeping it pretty basic? Okay. So, um, Arizona Pro Brett Height has a fondness for tidal fisheries because he likes to take the California uh, Delta because tidal water brings in, when it flushes in or flushes out and comes in, brings all these nutrients up and gets them, gets them moving, all right? And it also gets the crayfish moving and your shad and your bluegills and, and sometimes in July, I like July, especially on James, June, July time frame on the James because the small blue shell shell crabs will hatch, right? And back in the tributaries or creeks off your main uh, river like the James or the Chick or some of your bigger creeks like Herring, Powell's, uh, Wards, etc., these small soft shell crabs start to hatch and bass will eat them up like you will not believe. So I imitate, all right, I imitate them with a jig. Now the jig I don't have on tonight doesn't imitate one, but I have a jig color that's a green pumpkin, it's got a little bit of light blue in it, and a little bit of a light chartreuse. And then I use a certain trailer, and it's all compact, and it mimics, all right, that soft shell crab. And it works, it produces some pretty good fish. When I start caught seven and a quarter off the James, using that, you know, fishing wood. So, you have to play around with your forage, all right? I use swim jigs, I use swim sinkos, and I try it again. Like everybody's known in bass fishing, you match the hatch. What you're trying, you know, what's the chromometer out there, you try to match it, okay? No matter the weather, bass are already going to bite at least twice a day. Thanks to Tom Fishery Hike says, tides bring water to rich nutrients, and it washes through over grassy areas and your grass mats. All right, it's a basic pattern for Delta, a basic pattern for Louisiana, uh, Delta, the same thing for the Chesapeake and the Potomac. It just brings in nutrients, you know, and all. Tom and Barber's bass find many freshwater crayfish, such as bluegill, crayfish, shad, along with uh, marine forage, including mullet, blue crabs, and other wanders across the largemouth path. I mean, just like with the hickory shad. I've seen bass attack these big hickory shad that they were fishing for not too long ago up there. Uh, it's just amazing sometimes where I've seen them. I've caught bass before to where in the live well, you know, I keep them calm, my live wells are dark, and I put the uh, chemical balloon to uh, redo their slime coats and stuff like that, and I pulled one fish out one time, and he had a bluegill bigger in my mouth that he, that he, you know, barked up, he used that language, but he, that he upchucked, all right, and then I had to go, there goes a half a pound. Because you wait. Yeah. I said, there went a half a pound, you know. But it's really funny how they can take any gorge on things, especially during summer months. Remember though, we talk about when the water's colder, we have colder months, bass still feed, but they don't have to feed as often. They're not burning up energy, all right? Uh, but when that water temperature gets, you know, 79, 80, and gets up into the, the high 80s and 90s in some places, they are feeding. They gotta feed, all right, to keep up their strengths. Well, you said two fingers. Two fingers. I'm using two fingers. The other two. The other two. Well, I don't know, two way of skinny cat. There you go. Let's see. I'm going to kind of stand back here and everything. Uh, again, uh, Captain Steve called us. We go down to where it says fish in the. Um, 
the flood tide. Captain Steve Kokonis, he's a Potomac River guy, had been for years, was up in Alexandria, Virginia. If you have never fished the Potomac and you want someone to go out and have fun with, and also love teaching kids, I know two guides. One's Michael Hall, and the other one's Steve Kokonis, and they know the Potomac part well. Um, but anyway, um, Notice that rising water enables bass to graze shoreline vegetation for crawfish, mimicking these crustaceans by uh, intentionally hanging shallow running crankbaits, grass, gripping them free and all. You know, one thing I didn't do last week on the chit is I know the baits I was using in the areas I was in, I should have been catching fish, but I was not producing the fish I wanted to. Alright, and uh, I caught a couple on drop shot, but they were catfish. I'm like, what's going on with this? So I'll put that down. But I did not really pull out my crankbaits and, and run my shallow diving crankbaits. And I think, that, you know, if I did, I think I would have picked up some more bass or I can cover water. So also, when you're out there, right, and uh, we talked about rising tides, falling tides. Tides rotate in and out every six hours, all right? So you pretty much plan your day. But now let's talk about how you're going to fish the uh, Potomac, okay, the, the grass lines or the shore lines. It's well known that fish will move, as I'm talking about, up and down, all right, with the tide. It's also known that if you go into a marsh area, I have pads and I have grass, that when that tide's high, fish can scatter to places you cannot get to. So if you don't have, for example, um, tide is not going to be ideal for you until maybe, until maybe say, your 10 o'clock time period, what are you going to do between the time they launch you from a tournament till 10 o'clock? All right, are you going to go out and jump fishing? Or are you going to try to hit grass flats with top water, buzz baits, frogs, poppers, things of that nature? Also, I do that, but I look for areas where the bass cannot spread out. What do I mean by that? I look for natural walls that are built, all right, on the shore within the river that I'm fishing or the reservoir that I'm fishing where bass can rise with the water but they cannot be pushed up into the shoreline or back to shoreline deep in there where I cannot get. They can go left to right and cruise so I look for national banks, okay, or undercut banks because I tell you what, when tide drops, bass love the undercut banks and you got to use uh, pitching jigs and and running crankbaits past things like that or spinner baits to get them to, to, to dart out and react. Bass and tidal water also surge rather, rather quickly. You'll see this in the article. They talk about that for a few minutes. Meaning that most bass and, and, and moving tide, they are strong fighters for maybe the first, you know, uh, minute or so. You know, and then they still fight, but they're less, they're less as strong. They're used to that because they hold behind areas okay, when, they're, when that tide is moving in or out to where they use a lot of great strength and energy to surge out there, get their prey and go back into their hiding area, if you want to call it that, or into the things that create less current. You want to look at things like that when you're fishing high water and water's either coming in or going out, you want to work at things that are causing what we call breaks, okay, or eddies, where the current is slower, all right? You want to look at the backside of the log where the tide's coming in and the tide's going out this room and I have a big log, all right, I'm not going to fish the front side of that log where the tide's hitting. I'm going to hit the back side of that log and I'm going to hit it more than once. I'm going to hit it more than one angle. You have to do that. You have to pick it apart. If I can run a crankbait and bounce off that, just like that last year when I caught that seven and a quarter, I ran that jig, all right, and it was, a lot of it was luck, all right, but I threw it and I threw it just right to where it came down that log just right and it broke out into the limbs that were at the end of the log and that bass hit before she even got halfway down to the bottom. All right. But I would hit that log every time I go to the James and there's one particular place, I hit that log probably for a good 10 minutes fishing it in multiple angles with multiple different types of bait and presenting that bait differently each time because it might take that many times. Don't just hit it one time while there's nothing there and go on down, I'm telling you. All right, you missed a lot of opportunities, and I do it still today. You know, I didn't give my time enough chance the other day to use a certain bait that I know it would catch fish. I did not give it time, all right, to work for me. So you got to be cognizant of that. You got to be cautious of that. So again, in the morning time frame, I'm fishing areas of that incoming tide. I'm waiting for that tide to shift. I like the last hour to maybe an hour and a half of the incoming tide. Why? Because it slows down. It's not moving as fast. 
Okay, so again, I look for that. I'll look for grass clumps. Or I'll get, and that tide's high, we move to the inside grass line. All right, so in other words, I got a shoreline, then I have a grass line. Between the shoreline and that grass line, you might have sporadic grass, but you have an open area. It might be five yards wide, it might be 20, it might be 50, who knows? But we work the inside line, and then we work toward the outside line when that tide goes down. Bass will move up and down that tide, but they're gonna stay close to that cover. When tide's high, I'm throwing that top water bait, or I'm running that bait with minus, or I'm buzzing me a, uh, you know, a um, swim bait of some type. I'm trying to get a reaction strike of the fish to come out of that grass, all right, and hit that lure. And that's what they're gonna do because they're aggressive, they're, they're an aggressive predator. They will attack forage, all right? That's what they do. That's what they're out there for, you know? So fishing up in the grass, Jim, or along yeah, the line where the grass breaks in high the tide, In high tide, I would be all over on the inside line, fishing on top of the water, okay, to the inside line, whatever. There's a place down toward Argandale Flats that, you know, when that tide's high, I will all the way to the shoreline, to the bank, because there's a wall that I know that I can fish, at least pick up one or two bass. It could be nice and they could be little ones, but I always hit that area because I know there could be something there. The bass cannot go any further, they have to go up and down, all right, and, and you have to look at that. Also, I like fishing when the tide's high, all right, I fish the inside grass line and beyond because I'll find the uh, scattered clumps of structure. In this case, on the tonic, it's typically your hydro patches or whatever, but I'll find the scattered chunks of that, right, and I'll pitch a plastic down to it, or I'll run uh, a spinner bait next to it or a crankbait, but typically it's a plastic, all right, and a lot of time frames this time of year is a fluke. I'll toss a fluke out there and I'll pop it once a time and I'll just let it down. But once I feel that fluke go into cover or go into the top of grass, I hold it and I just barely try to work that thing out because as soon as she breaks out from that top, usually a bass is nailing it. And when they nail it, they nail it. So you have to work it that way and you have to experience it. Now that tide goes out, I'm working and then you're at. When I'm at low tide, I'm working the outside of that grass line. Or when I can see the top of that grass mat and I see holes and pockets, then I'm flipping things down into those holes and pockets. But primarily, I want to fish, in my opinion, I like fishing the cleaner cut grass lines. Okay, so if I'm going down, I've got a clean cut grass line, and all of a sudden she jumps out, okay, five feet, ten feet, whatever the distance may be, there's going to be a fish on that, on that top that's jumped out there, on that point. Because it creates points, and that's what hiding place. You're going to be down current side. To, you know, and so I'll throw something over the top, and as soon as it comes over and drops, bam. I love throwing Cinco's, okay, or even a 316th ounce uh, Texas rig uh, blue flat worm, I'll throw it up on a grass mat, all right, and I'll personally drag it off until she barely starts to drop on that grass edge. And when she drops on that grass edge, all right, those fish hit. I don't need these grass mats, okay, in typically use tidal water, okay, not so much maybe the uh, James River, because you got tight what we call uh, millfoil, in the James, but on the Potomac with combination of high and millfoil, you have tunnels underneath this grass. All right, it might be three feet there, but it's so compacted, like there's a foot and a half of nothing but tunnels underneath of that. Because they got long stalks and they got the leaf parts. I don't know the technical name for that, but um, so sometimes, you know, if I want a big bite, I'll go to punching. I I really don't like punching, so I'll go to punching. Okay, the pads. I, I find it very uh, boring. But um, so there's ways to do that. But so you want to work to tie it inside and out. That's you know that's the key and everything. But the thing is, don't be afraid to experiment. Now for you shore and your bank, or for your bank fishermen and shore fishermen right now, when you're fishing Potomac and you're fishing the tide, it's going to be very hard to do a lot of things that we just talked about tonight. Okay, all you can really do is wait okay, for really the fish to do what they should be hopefully doing and maybe in a close proximity or area that you're at, you know. 